Hello and welcome to the Raptors show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Suits. Time to get fired up. Make sure you find the Raptors show wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, subscribe, please rate and review the program. I'm your host, Wayne Blue. Got co-host Blake Murphy with me. Blake, how was, how was, how was your Thursday night? What did you do Thursday night other than watching the Blue Jays probably? Uh, no, they were off. Oh, thank goodness. Um, no, they played so poorly in the Houston series. <laughs> Major League Baseball was like, no, we need a break from this. League-wide, we're, we're taking the night off. Uh, the Raptors were off as well. We just, like, as Toronto sports fans, yeah. got to breathe. There got to be real people yeah. for a night. Yeah. And then lock back in tonight because now it's uh, Raptors, Jays, women's NCAA Final Four. Yes. Uh, it's a big, it's quickly, it's WrestleMania weekend, Will, which I know is big for you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's uh, there's a lot going on. Got you. Look forward to rooting for The Rock or whatever you guys do. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you guys do. I don't know, man. There's no... Uh, uh, just enjoy it. It's just, yeah, do people I'm, root for individual wrestlers? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay, okay. Absolutely. Yeah, All Cody right. Rhodes is the big one this year. Cody that everyone's. Uh, yeah, the yeah. only... There's no basketball tie-in that I can think of this year other than Logan Paul is wrestling and he's now the official uh, energy... Or the, he's the, the official drink of the Raptors now. Mm, um, that's right. That's the closest thing I got to a basketball tie-in. Yeah, well... Yeah, well, you know what? I, I'm actually... I was very appreciative of the fact that there was a little bit of time yesterday to just, like, disconnect a little bit. Had a great dinner in Alma. Shouts to Alma. If you haven't been to Alma, it, the incredible meal uh, made by Chef Anna. It's also, like, it's got, got two Michelin stars and everything like that. Like, it's, you know, not not to brag, but it, it was a phenomenal meal. Yeah. So They couldn't get, the they couldn't get that Alma. third one or what? No, no. I think they just had, like, for two different I'm, years I'm, on the little plaques. Yeah, I'm kidding, man. That's yeah. uh, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really good. I haven't been there, but it looked – you told me about it yesterday. I looked yeah, yeah, at uh, – yeah, it was uh, – yeah. Go to Burdock good. Brewery afterwards right beside it. Get a, get get some brews. Is Grange on the line? Yeah, I, man. He, oh, Grange is on the line there, this yeah. whole time. He's just listening. To, like, yeah, he's he's bringing up the menu right now. He's like, oh, I got to get Will to break me off some – Grange, I don't know. at the end of the season, you deserve some Alma, man. You you put in a lot of work covering this uh, – this this flaming tire fire and uh just hope you treat yourself at the end of it you know i uh i fantasize i spent a lot of time thinking about the end of the season yes <laughs> <laughs> no one energy no, goes there. no one two three cancun for you grange uh there'll be one two three something I promise <laughs> you that. okay all right well before we before we get to that i mean another major uh, story written by you uh with elliot freeman as well on this one and you know it's big time when you got to bring in elliot for this too um i sorry before we get into the actual very serious article yeah. i have a very goofy question and i i texted elliot about this ma making fun a little bit but how did you guys decide so the byline is michael grange and elliot freeman mm -hmm. but you got the headshot it's your headshot there <laughs> do you guys like debate over that you're like oh like in the google doc this was 54 percent written by grange so he gets the headshot how because like i mean not that you're not a big deal but that's elliot freeman and you got the you got the headshot over him yeah, I, I, uh, I'm not sure exactly how that happened, but, um, you know, Elliot's a great guy and uh, he's awesome to work with and he's very gracious. And, and you know, I kind of approached him and said, listen, I, you know, I've got some things I think we should, I think are important to write about. And, and obviously you have some insights that I might not have based on kind of where you spend your most of your time. And um, so he was he was happy to chip in and, and um yeah, very gracious in terms of uh, how we shared the credit. And, uh, yeah, I, I think it made it a lot better. Yeah. Okay, so the piece is up on sportsnet.ca. With MLSC ownership and teams in flux, Keith Pelly will have his hands full in a new role. Grange, we'll start from the very top. Who is Keith Pelly? What is his new role? Yeah, Keith Pelly is a guy who, um, you know, he's been a – I wouldn't call a behind-the-scenes operator. He's been very much uh, in the front of the house operator – in the Toronto sports scene for a long, long time. I mean, going back, uh, uh, you know, decades, he was the president. He ran TSN uh, when, uh, you know, for for many years, and then uh, most recently, uh, before he was off in Europe, uh, running the uh, PGA European PGA Tour, he was he ran Rogers Rogers Sportsnet, Rogers Media, uh, not just Sportsnet, all of Rogers Media. And in between that, he was the kind of force behind what was called the Olympic Broadcast Consortium, where uh, Rogers and Bell Media came together to help broadcast the 2010 games. He's worn a bunch of other hats in between that. He ran the Toronto Argonauts briefly, of course, won a uh, uh, great cup when he was doing that. So he's very familiar with all the big big players in uh in kind of the MLSC picture and and 
and um, they are in turn familiar with him. So in terms, and obviously there is a lot in this article about the future of Larry Tannenbaum and, and his ownership share, and I, we want to get to that. But with respect to Pelly, this the the way it reads and everything we know about him, but the way you and Elliot laid it out is this is a, a big change in the CEO chair relative to how things have operated the last couple of years. This is closer to the Tim Laiwiki model back in 2015, where he was a very visible part of the organization. A lot, uh, you know, a lot of what you heard about Masai Jiri, about Brandon Shanahan and things like that were attached to Laiwiki. And then since he's left, it's been less public facing people or interim people in those roles. And, you know, Messiah and Shanahan with the direct line to the board uh, rather than through the CEO if they if they wanted that. How big a change is this going to be in terms of how a Masai Jiri operates with, you know, Keith Pelly now in that CEO role? Um, you know, I think there's two ways to answer that. I, I, I mean, I think practically not all that much. I think... Um, you know the the presidents that uh, Brent that Tim Lawicki hired, being um, you know most prominently Brendan Shanahan on the hockey side, and of course my Masai Jiri here with the Raptors, uh, were were given a lot of leeway, a lot of power, a lot of responsibility, a lot of uh, a profile, and you know and freedom to kind of and support to kind of pursue their agendas, which were very aggressive and I think quite fruitful. Um, the what's and so much so that I think when when Tim Lewicki left, there was an appetite to kind of just keep the status quo and, and let these guys kind of run their silos and, and, and keep succeeding sort of thing. What's going to happen, I believe, now that Keith Pelly is in charge, is he will be very much in charge. And so, you know, I think it takes it a little bit out of uh, the board's hands, it's more in Keith's hands, and he's going to be the, the person reporting to the board about the progress plans, um, focus for, you know, the three primary drivers within MLSC being obviously TFC, the Raptors, and the Leafs. And, you know, just by the nature of that, um, your team presidents um, are a little less powerful. They're, they, they you know, there's not that they ever were using an end around kind of thing, but, you know, the kind of buck stops with Keith Pelly. Um, and that's, that's, I think the most practical thing. I'm not sure if it's going to really tangibly uh, mean much in the competitive landscape because, you know, the interests of MLSC, you know, I don't think they change all that much is the better your teams are doing, the better uh, product you're putting out there, the more you're generating, um, you know, all the positive synergies that, that kind of make your company go. Um, but it is it is a change, and um, it does doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the last change. But I think it's it's the first one of of what I think will may be some significant ones. Okay, so as you mentioned here, um, Larry is going to be bought out. That's the expectation, and at that point, the MLSC board will be fifty fifty. And I wouldn't necessarily say that um, our company here at Rogers or with Bell, you know, it's I don't know. Fifty fifty sounds like it could be a real stalemate. Um, how yeah. is Keith going to manage and navigate that? And sorry, just for, for background detail for anyone who doesn't know, the, the way things currently work, you know, uh, Bell has three voting shares on the eight-person exec board. Rogers has three, and Larry Tannenbaum has control two. Right. So Larry Tannenbaum has kind of been the, the tiebreaker, for lack of a better mm -hmm. term, if it were to be 50-50, where Rogers and Bell both have four, and there is a, you know, a stalemate between Rogers' interests and Bell interests, say, it, how much of Keith Pelly's job come 2026, if this plays out, is managing that potential 50-50 friction, if, if it does exist? I think that's going to be a big part of it. And I think really, um, you know, what, what I think all this portends is, you know, even a bigger change than, than, than just Larry leaving. And, and I think, um, you know, I kind of hinted at it in the piece and you can't, you know, you don't have a crystal ball. You can't predict exactly how these things go. But, um, you know, I think that there is a world where it it doesn't stay 50-50, that, you know, one of the existing owners um, ends up becoming the controlling owner, if not the only owner. And if you were kind of looking at the profile of the various interests involved, um, 
you know, you'd sort of handicap it and say it would be sort of the Rogers piece. They're the, you know, they're the company that has an existing, uh, pre-existing sports franchise that they own wholly, and that's obviously the Toronto Blue Jays. And, um, you know, it's it, there. you talk to people within the sports community, the business community, and they can kind of envision a world where, um, you know, NLSC, falls under the Edward Rogers umbrella and is joined there with the Blue Jays. And it is one massive yeah. con conglomeration. Yeah. And by the way, that's not all that different than what I think Larry Tannenbaum was hoping and had sort of been working to achieve for a long time in his own right. And then you look at the Bell interest and look, they've had an amazing run and they've certainly, you know, their, their investment I think is probably quadrupled. <laughs> since since they got into this into the ownership stake with MLSE, but you know, if you know how long do you know maybe they want to cash out? Maybe there's an opportunity for them to cash out, and you know a lot of this stuff is above my area of expertise. But um, you know, I think the fundamental thing here is is Larry, right? Larry is probably going to be bought out um, on paper. It should happen sometime in 2026. Um, you did. You know, there's these things can change, um, and then we've already seen where Larry Tannenbaum has started his own sports venture company, so mm -hmm. he's going to have his own. Uh, he's going to be heard, I think, in his own way. But um, you know, we're looking for at a very different environment. I think two, three years from now than we have today. Okay, assuming Larry's out 2026, as expected. Um, what where does that leave Masai? Because we we know. The reporting around Masai's contract negotiations the last time it came up. And uh, we know that Larry was definitely has always been a really strong backer of Masai. And we also have learned through this piece that Masai's contract was actually a five-year deal. And it actually lines up with Larry's deal. So if Larry's out, does that mean Masai is out potentially? You know, I'm not going to draw a, um, a straight line to that. Um, but it's... Uh, it's not unreasonable <laughs> to okay. kind of wonder about that, um, you know, and I think there's a lot of things that can happen. And there was a lot of reporting and good reporting done around um, size contract negotiation, which was very prolonged, right? Like, I mean, it, it got sewn up in August of 2021, but, you know, it had been kind of brewing for a long time before that. And um, among the concerns were the changing face of MLSC at that time and where would Masai, you know, where would his kind of support lie? And I think what also uh, kind of bubbled into the public sphere and, and is is just how contentious um, some of the ownership relationships are at the board level. And, you know, and, and, and I think the when Masai was pushing for his deal, the, the kind of the pushback came from the Rogers side and it was, um, you know, I think there's that relationship has been mended. I think it's amicable, it's functional, but at the time it was, you know, do we need to invest this much into uh, the president of our basketball team? And by the way, a lot of those same questions were asked around investing in the president of the hockey and the, and the soccer operations too. And it was based on, is this the best way for us to spend our money? And I think right now they're spending about 25 million annually um, on three team presidents. And you kind of look how each of those teams have done in the last three or four years. It's, you know, you sure. sort of be hard to justify. Um, so I think that's where the questions are gonna get asked. And um, what the answers are, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and predict, but um, I, I think it's reasonable based on kind of pre-existing relationships that, yeah, you could be looking at a change with Masai Jury and the Raptors. How could that affect, how, obviously we're talking about 2026, to so the end of the 2025-2026 season, that's two full seasons from now. However, we know that when these things get closer to potential expiration dates, you know, sometimes the two sides will call it early because, hey, you do you want someone steering the ship who is not going to be here? Do you want someone trading draft picks who's not going to be here to wear the freight of that? Do you want someone... You know, there are different things with respect to timeline. Um, and that's before getting into, you know, I, I don't think my read on it has always been Masai wouldn't do the job if he didn't have basketball autonomy, like roster autonomy and things like that. The NBA has very strict rules about the minimums you can spend anyway. So that really the decisions are not about spending. It's about how you chop that money up. But the timeline kind of thing and how quickly this rebuild 
uh, how quick that rebuild is, how quickly that becomes a retooling and they're trying to be competitive again is maybe something that at the CEO level, um, it's important for there to be alignment between the MLSC CEO and the president of the Raptors. Um, given that Masai is now kind of, I guess, on a two-year clock, if that's how we're looking at this and that those are the details of his contract, um, how how tough could that be to navigate this coming off season? It's such a big off season for the Raptors in terms of um, decision-making around when is the timeline going to be around Scotty Barnes, probably the last time they have cap space for a while, potentially a couple high draft picks in this draft and the the ability to maybe move those uh, for win now pieces. Like, like how much does that question mark hanging over things uh, potentially bleed into this off season? You know, it's, I mean, it's a great question. It's, it's a, it's a pressing question. Um, but I guess the way I would answer that is, you know, this almost identical set of circumstances has been part of the Raptors story for a few years now or, or previous years. Right. So we've seen the Ujiri kind of get all the way to free agency. Remember, that's how we were talking about back then. And, you know, he's always been very consistent in terms of uh, making decisions that suit, um, you know, the long-term plan or or medium-term goals of the team. In other words, um, I don't think it's, you know, he's, I don't think it's, it's, these changes we're talking about are going to affect decisions made this summer um in terms of who gets drafted what you do with picks these kinds of things i think it's going to be you know business unusual business <laughs> business as usual um until it's not and and then it'll be you know i think we'll we'll you know we'll find out what happens then so um yeah that's that's the way i would answer that is is if you look back at the history of, of with Masai and various contract eight you know, eras he's been in, been in. He's kind of conducted himself really consistently. So I don't think there's going to be a, a sharp veer one way or the other. Yeah, so I think thinking back to when the last round of negotiations were with Masai, I think part of the frustration or confusion from the fan base was like, everyone, obviously, we, we really like Masai as a person, but also we love the fact that what he's done with the Raptors. It was unprecedented. They had won the championship over his previous, you know, tenure there, had multiple winning seasons, and it was like, when can we just get this done? Let's sew it up. Like, what else can he do? Obviously, he's earned whatever he's asking for. I think in the five years, and I guess only been three, but the five years plus the next two years coming up, it's like, will he have done enough to, you know, make it as much of a slam dunk? And I think that, for me, is very much an open question. I mean, I, I'm not going to put anything past him in terms of just being able to turn things around really quickly or find some sort of really incredible prospect. or You know what I mean? Like, th there's a lot that can go into this. And that's why you pay him the big bucks. But if it kind of goes the same way it's gone the last three years, then it's a much, much harder negotiation. And it was already a hard one to begin with. Like, Yeah, you... I mean, I think that's really well phrased. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, if if his name wasn't Masai Ujiri, if it was somebody else, and you look at the track record of the last three or four years, you know, you'd give him, you'd give whoever it was really hard marks on Scotty Barnes. I think mm -hmm. obviously a great pick and a great decision to tank for that pick um and you know i think grady grady dick has turned out to be a really good pick at number 13. um but you know there's a lot of other decisions and we've all spent a lot of time nitpicking on them uh that you know kind of deserve scrutiny right and and they haven't all worked out perfectly and and you're kind of you know you're in a direction now that did you actually choose to be in this direction or did it kind of was it kind of handed to you by circumstance and um, and had you chosen it or sooner, could you have been further along in the process of rebuilding or retooling? So those are all really fair questions. I think it's it's nearly impossible, at least for me, to kind of separate um, the fact that there is a lot of fortune and luck that goes into building NBA rosters. And I think also when you look at you know what he has brought to the organization from 2013-14 until you know let's just say today. I mean, you know, it, that's a lot of equity. Oh, yeah. That is a lot Absolutely. of equity. Yeah. And, you know, and I think it's a mistake to sort of go just because things have kind of hit the skids here a little bit to kind of start dancing around and going, you know, time to move on. But, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a fair question. I think it is a, you know, this is a results-based business. And, you know, and I, I think it's quite fair to say that, you know, if and when these decisions end up being made, and I don't know if it's 
if it goes right to two years from now, maybe it's a year from from now. I don't know. Um, you know, the the, the record, uh, say post two thousand twenty, uh, will be part of those decisions. And and conversely, you know, the reverse is also true. One of those reasons those negotiations pushed out so hard was, you know, Masai Jerry was he was a free agent. He was looking uh, around at other opportunities, both within the NBA and beyond. And he did have some other opportunities. Right. And um, you know, that that was all part of just like any free agent, right? That's all part of getting, you know, it's not getting the best opportunity, best deal he could for himself. He did it. I think it, at the time he was, if not the highest paid executive in North America, he's very, very close, depending on how you calculate some of the other uh, packages. And, um, you know, but those questions all get asked again, you know, either sometime in this, in the future, which is kind of coming on a little quicker than maybe most people expected. At least that future is coming on, uh, I mean, quicker than people expected, but also mercifully at this point. Uh, there are only uh, six games left in this season. Um, but that's part of this whole discussion. Is yeah. like, you can't let the product get to the point where people, like, whatever. Diehard fans are always going to watch. Diehard fans are probably like, it's actually a good thing that they're tanking, getting more lottery odds and all that kind of stuff. I think the bigger business, per like, is the casual person of being like, Hey, you want to go to a Raptors game? Sure, why not? I've never been. Or like, yeah, I liked, it. I loved it. I went a couple years ago. Let's go again. Those are the actual. Are you targeting. losing the people that came on in 2019? And the consumer confidence in the product is <laughs> lower and lower. Like, I, I don't think you would, you would talk to the average person who is in that those shoes, and they're like, yes, I'm so excited. It's like, ah, I heard the Raptors are not good right now. A 45 percent chance yeah. at a at a top six pick That's, in a weak draft class that might contribute right. three years from now. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, look, I, I think, uh, at least speaking for myself, but I, I do suspect you guys are similar on this. I totally agree. Like, from my perspective, I would like to see them continue to show faith in Masai because Masai has brought this franchise so much more success than you've ever had in terms of when you look at the historical perspective. I'm just trying to look at it from the changing uh, ownership landscape, the changing, the fact that he's got a new boss. And honestly, the last time a new boss came in was Tim Laiwiki, who brought Masai in. Like, when you bring in new boss... It typically does relate to new personnel coming in as well. You yeah, know? it does, and that so, that would I mean I'd I'm imagine to see from their perspective. Yeah, and I'd imagine those conversations are are ongoing. Like M Michael even included in his piece that um, Pelly was at a practice the other day, right, chopping right. it up with my with Masai and Bobby. Um, you know, learn learning that new offense. Uh, at, at this point, roster wise, Keith, Keith Pelly might get some minutes at backup center too yeah. uh, to really get a feel for the product. But no, you're you're right. Like there is how Keith Pelly and to a greater extent come 2026 what could be a changing board of MLSE, who are Pelly's bosses, that's who he reports to, how they weigh legacy and equity built versus what have you done for me lately is going to be really interesting to, to see play out. And, you know, I, I don't think this was set to be a long piston style multi-year teardown anyway. Um, they just, the, the front office just hasn't shown that DNA for years. Um, but you do wonder if that kind of thing, you know, maybe turns a two and a half year rebuild into what uh, an attempt at a one and a half year rebuild or something like that. Right. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I mean, look, I, I still ultimately do your earlier question. Like I, Masai's not done anything that makes me feel like I don't trust that he's acting in the franchise's best interest versus his own best interest. Like it's been very clear. He's acting in the franchise. Yeah. Just sometimes you, you miss or sometimes your yeah. timing's a little off. You have too much, you know, too much. What, what was his phrase? He had too much patience with the last group. Maybe, maybe could have, uh, you know, you ask Masai about last year's team, even now, he'll he'll tell you, he's like, I don't know why it didn't work. It, yeah. it should have worked. I mean, look at the players that were on that team around the league right now. Like, like obviously, you just like him OG's right hurt, but like <laughs> the Raptors 2022 roster is like the EPM leaderboard. Like, oh, okay. like it's uh, it's all like Jeff Downs back in the lead. Delano Band's uh, killing it. Like all these things. Uh, anyway, those things are difficult. Grange, it, it, we're, we're a couple games away from the end here. Uh, I know your focus, in addition to this big MLS piece, has, as most of us has been, has been on Grady Dick. It is is how he closes out the season here kind of the the most front of mind thing for you as we play out the string here? Yeah, it has been. I just, it'll be interesting, you know, I'm glad that they've gained some separation mm. <laughs> between the Grizzlies. And so yeah. uh, hopefully something that looks a little bit more like a NBA roster on the floor with Grady Dick. I think there's been diminishing returns recently. Uh, you know, when you're putting out a team of guys who just collectively, no, no shade on anybody, 
just aren't ready to compete at the NBA level. And so I think when you're the rookie out there who's kind of a dependent player, it's hard to look good. Um, so hopefully, you know, if our, when our, you get RJ back, you got quick back, you got, you know, uh, a little bit more semblance of, of structure out there and, and, you know, he can continue to take some of these lessons and, and carry them into summer league. But I think his, you know, I think he's, he's been a very, uh, he's had an outsized importance I'd say this year. And I think it comes from a couple of places. One is, you know, there haven't been a ton of draft successes or new finds talent wise outside Scotty, obviously. And so in early in the season, when it looked like he was, he was really struggling and, you know, we're all like, Hey, you can't judge a rookie based on two months, but it was a tough two months. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think he got swept up in some of those, those doubts and questions. And I think conversely, once the season kind of shifted hard to a rebuild and seeing the kind of two months he was able to put up, let's say in February and most of March, um, I think it was really encouraging. I think it, it became kind of the most exciting thing about this season almost. Yeah. And uh, so hopefully, um, you know, hopefully going forward, there's a lot more of what we've seen in, you know, January, February, and a bit of March than than what we saw before that. I'd love to read a piece about that at sportsnet.ca next week. <laughs> oh, I am yeah. working on a piece about that. Yeah, so that should be out next week. But uh, got a lot of typing to go still. Yeah, well, the season started with Grady getting sent down to the G League, and uh, the season's ending with the G League being sent up to Grady. <laughs> so, <laughs> Grange, we appreciate you. We'll see you back at Scotiabank Arena uh, on Sunday. And, uh, yeah, you know, we'll appreciate you breaking all this thing down for us because uh, this is this is a lot of high-level stuff, especially at the ownership level uh, in terms of management at MLSC. And, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's quite confusing, honestly, without the explainers and the reporting, so I appreciate it. Hey, thanks, and uh, hey, we're all just along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Grange. Thanks, Grange. All right, we're going to take that break. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. Welcome back to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, Wim Lou. We'll be joined by co-host Blake Murphy. Big thanks to Michael Grange for coming on and breaking down all the palace intrigue. I love the uh, Toronto version of succession uh, that is taking place uh, in the city. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it will be a lot of questions as to what the Raptors do in the bigger picture. However, in the minor picture, in the smaller picture, it's time now for today's spicy take brought to you by new chunky spicy soup. Are you ready to get fired up? Here is the take for this week. The tank for the Raptors, it's over. It's actually mission accomplished. Okay. The Raptors have already locked in for lottery odds. They're three games behind Memphis at seven, and they're three games up on Portland at five. The Raptors are the sixth best lottery odds. Portland plays the Celtics, the Pelicans, and three playing hopefuls. They're not getting three wins. And guess what? The Raptors aren't getting three wins either to threaten their way back above Memphis. But here's the thing. Despite saying that, the Raptors actually do need to do whatever possible not to finish the year on a 21-game losing streak, which honestly, <laughs> at this current rate, there's a real chance of it. The Raptors obviously coming off a 48-point loss uh, in, Min uh, in uh, Minneapolis. But yeah, I mean, you just you definitely don't want to do that. Um, at number six right now, the Raptors have a 46% chance at keeping their first-round pick this year uh, should it stay in the top six. And whatever, we've accepted this. This is the price of the Acapurto trade. If it doesn't, you know, convey this year, then it, the same threat will roll over for next year, et cetera, et cetera. But at least this year, the Raptors are locked in at six. Basically, there's no way that they can really change the standings. Um, at this point, you're just going to have to sweat it out until May 12th when the NBA does the lottery draw in Chicago. So putting the tanking portion aside, which again is over, the Raptors just got to focus on themselves. Do they really want to finish a year on a 21-game losing streak? Is it fair to Darko and the players to get grilled about this as season, you know, and when, when the locker room clean out comes, when, I mean, Masai probably, whoever from front office, and it better it better be Masai, he should be asked about this. And, but honestly, for the team itself, do they really want to win on a, you know, finish on a 21-game losing streak? Does, honestly, this might sound corny, but does reputation not even matter at this point? You know what I mean? Like, what happens to winning culture? Obviously, that's probably out the door anyway. My point is, just go out there and snap the streak. It's safe. It's safe to win again, okay? It's safe. And ideally, you snap the streak at home. Washington, this Sunday, it's at home. It's at 6 p.m. It's perfect. You know, you get Kelly, RJ, Emmanuel, 
Bruce Brown, Gary Trent, Ochai, if he's not sore anymore, get those guys in the lineup, maybe one last time, whatever. Just go get that result. It's Washington at home. And again, it's safe to win now. The lottery odds aren't changing. And guess what? The game after that is also at home, and it's even better. It's the season finale, at least at home, for the Raptors. Clearly they're not going to play no play in or playoffs. And it's against the Pacers. And guess what? You want to tank? You actually improve your lottery position or your draft position if you beat the Pacers, whose pick you actually own. Now, of course, that's a much more difficult thing to do, to beat the Pacers than the Wizards. But honestly, get those players together one last time. Play those two games out. Get some wins. This season is already one of the worst in franchise history. Okay, you have longtime vets like Garrett Temple saying on our program that he's never seen anything like this, and he's literally seen it all, right? This guy was on Washington. He was on Sacramento. He was on Brooklyn. Please don't end the season on a 21-game losing streak. At least save a bit of dignity at the end. That is a spicy take of this week. It's a good spicy take, and I uh, I agree with it. Memphis also plays Detroit tonight, so Memphis might win another game. And like, if you're the Raptors, Dude, you're not we're, going. We're, you're we're not done. winning four games the rest of the way. Like you, yeah, like it's safe to win. Yeah, and you know you've got the road game at Brooklyn, which maybe you win. But those two, those last two games of the season, yeah. Miami still has a chance to avoid the plan. They're going to be wanting oh, those games play, yeah. like hell. Indiana's going to want that game like hell because they're trying to avoid the plan right now. There's also draft pick wise. There's like a. If you could beat Indiana and you knock them down into the play-in, say Indiana, if you lose in the play-in, you don't mm. make the playoffs, you enter the lottery. Oh, yeah. Now, we that, just saw that with the Raptors. Yeah. With Grady Dick. yeah. So that pick is top three protected. So you wouldn't want the Pacers to, like, win the lottery. I mean, but there's a on. chance you end They'd up with They'd have to a, literally win the lottery to win the lottery. Yeah. There. But, yeah. hey, it's it's non-zero percent chance, right? So right. you got to uh, you got to pay mind to it. But, yeah, there is incentive to win these games. And, like, again, they can't – they're not catching Portland on the other. Portland is not going to win three games. Mm-hmm. Memphis is not going to the, – the Raptors aren't going to win four games. Memphis will probably win tonight. Um, so, yeah, you could just play. Yeah. And it's uh, – Here's a novel concept. You could just go out there and play and win the game. Yeah. And, and, and put your best players available and play them in a way that will try to win the game. I yeah. know it's it's not been done for a while, but I would love to see it done at least one more time. And whatever. More if, it's, if it's not tonight because you want to give those guys who are banged up one more day – and you know, focus on Sunday, whatever, because it's the Bucks tonight and yeah, it's the Wizards it on Sunday I, or whatever. I, I did not say tonight. Don't yeah. Worry. Um, although yeah. the Bucks did just lose to the Wizards and the Grizzlies on a back to back. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'd be. I, I would love to do a little bit of Doc Rivers slander, I guess, if they win tonight. You know their their record with Doc Rivers? What's the record with Doc Rivers now? Is it five hundred? Yeah, fifteen of fifteen. God, that's tough. I mean, I don't think Griffin did a great job with the team. We discussed it plenty on the show, but I think the record was thirty one and thirteen. Yeah, they're way above 500. Yeah, they were the second. I mean, they're still second in the East, uh, but they were second in the East when yeah. uh, when they let him go. Yeah. Um, the East is kind of mid. Yeah, it is. Like, we, we just met Indiana and Miami that's, are that's, fighting uh, to avoid the plan. They've been 15 and 15, and they're still second in the East. Like, yeah, like, how did nobody catch on, up man. that ground? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Meanwhile, like, uh, in the West, the, the, you know, the Warriors keep winning. They had a really good win against uh, uh, Houston. Yesterday, I guess that was the only team that was like kind of threatening to yeah, knock them can, out of the play-in. Yeah, they can clinch tonight. Yeah, so you know what they they got rid of that. We've seen the Lakers coming to town. The Lakers have been winning quite a bit now as well. Um, eight and two in the last ten. You know, like the the West is the West. Yeah, the only know? teams that really what aren't like East? cooking uh, in the of those eleven teams at the top of the West, like Sacramento lost Monk and Herder, mm-hmm. and I mean they were. I still maintain they were overperforming a little bit. I don't want to yeah. ding them now because they're missing two key yeah, rotation whatever. pieces. But, like, they've slid a little bit. And even they've won six of their last ten. They've just, like, lost ground relative. And then the Pelicans have lost three in a row, which is, you know, uh, always uh, – the Pelicans just have this penchant over the last couple of years to They're just, like, team. have weeks where they look bad. Um, but they have, they've also, like, looked really good at times this year. Right. Uh, so, I don't know. The, the West is a thresher, and it's going to mean for – it's going to make for some, like, really fun games these last couple of weeks where – yeah, there is still, like, Golden State probably can't get out of the play-in, but the Lakers, Kings, and Pelicans all probably think they could catch Phoenix and or Dallas. Yeah. Um, the Clippers are the only team that are really, like, insulated in a spot because the other three teams are all within a game of each other mm-hmm. for uh, home like for home court advantage throughout the Western Conference playoff bracket, which, like, maybe you don't care that much about being the one seed because, like, okay, well, you might end up with, like, the Lakers or Warriors on the other side of that. Is that yeah. really that great a, a prize? But you do want home court through, like, hey, if you're if you're going to have to beat the Nuggets, 
you'd rather do that <laughs> at home than yeah. on the road. So it's going to be fascinating there. And then, yeah, in the East, basically, it's like, well, everyone's still jockeying for position. But it's like, hey, Philadelphia didn't win. For, like, Philadelphia didn't play good basketball for like a month when mm -hmm. Embiid and Maxi were out. And then after Embiid comes back, two good wins. They could, like, they're right on the yeah. edge of avoiding the play-in now. It's like, it, that's how mid the East has been. That just, hey, give me give me two games with Embiid back and we're, and we're right back in this. No, it, it's, uh, I, look, in the West, I genuinely feel like I, I'm not entirely sure. Other than Denver, who obviously I'm very, very sure in. But outside of them, like, you tell me any of these other two teams and the rest of the teams in the playoffs, like, lose in the first round, like, it wouldn't even be that surprise. Like, if Minnesota lost in the first round because they matched up with, like, the Lakers, like, it wouldn't be that big of a surprise. It would be disappointing for Minnesota, for example. Yeah. But you're like, okay, well, you know, like, you you lost to LeBron and AD. Um, that That's difficult. OKC, if they, right now, they're the third seed. They play Phoenix. Okay, I'd be a little surprised if they, <laughs> Phoenix just doesn't impress me that much. <laughs> Yeah. But still, like, it's not unreasonable that, like, a team with Devin Booker and Kevin Durant outplay, you know, OKC, a really young squad coming up. You know, the 4-5 right now is the Lakers, or the Clippers versus uh, Dallas, which would be really interesting. Yeah. Um, big question there, and big with rematch, anything Clippers yeah. being, Kawhi being out again now, right now and coming off a road yeah. trip with knee soreness. Right. Um, I know people have their, like, tongue-in-cheek, oh, he got his 65 games and now he's, I saw someone say he's using all his PTO now because <laughs> he got his 65 games in. Um, yeah, you and I would know nothing about that. But actually. yeah. We're it's the a, exact opposite when this comes to work. <laughs> no comment. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's um, it's a concern, obviously, that, that Kawhi's knees banged up now. But yeah, like yeah. the West is going to be. Dude, we just saw the Clippers beat the Nuggets last night. Yeah. You know, and that was without Kawhi as well. And I mean, and Jokic played MVP level as, as he always does. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's no Jamal Murray, so obviously that's a big factor too. But, like, I don't know. Sometimes I watch the Nuggets, and I'm like, they are kind of, like, really short in the rotation. Like, when they play the starters, phenomenal. They yeah. crush everybody. I have no no doubts. But, like, that's, I trust, like, two guys off that bench. It's tough. And, like, one of Reggie Jackson. And, like, yeah. Really? And, like, one of the guys I trust off the bench is Peyton Watson, who is, like, a really, really fun, high-event guy. But, like... There are yeah. games where it's like you're doing too much, man. Like yeah, you gotta, yeah, right. and, and maybe they're giving him the freedom to do that, and he can dial it back. And again, I'm a big Peyton Watson guy, but yeah, there's some risk there of like, there are bad stretches, and like, Christian Brown plays 30 minutes sometimes off your bench. Yeah, um, who's again is solid, like, but they don't trust Julian Strother at this point anymore. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. This is my, um, this is my. It's gonna be. It's tough, man. The West is so tough. <laughs> this is like my my not so spicy take. Is the Nuggets actually do miss Bruce Brown? Yeah, like they they fully miss that version of Bruce Brown, not like the one that's shown up in Toronto, um, with the suitcase back, but like the one that was in like Denver's rotation last year. Like he was really really productive, and that's where again, if the, if you're going back to the Raptors, like that's where it's like you hope that people still remember that version, and that's the value that it continues to have. Because call, call me up in July, Denver. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> no, but seriously though, I mean. I, I, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Bruce was always going to get cashed out after that, that winning the title yeah. and everything like that. Um, and in, Indiana came through with this really creative offer, which also allowed them to get Pascal Siakam without touching the rotation. But, like, it hasn't really worked out for Bruce, I would say, other than the, the payout. Mm -hmm. um, and it hasn't worked out for the Nuggets either. <laughs> like, it just kind of, like, hurt yeah. the whole situation. And, yeah. like, I get it. As Denver, like, with that ownership, like, they're never going to be a deep tax team, I don't think. No, like, not, like, not super. 22 million, man. Come right. Yeah. And, like, I mean, they couldn't really anyway. Yeah, exactly. Like, they could have given him the, you know, you could have figured it out with the mid-level and stuff like that. Sure. Um, but, yeah, if you're Bruce Brown, you get two years worth of mid-level in one year. Even even if the Raptors, you know, let's say they decided, well, we're, de we're declining the team option. We can't find a trade. We don't want to pay you $23 million. Mm. Um Bruce Brown would like still get the full mid level, so he basically got one year. Like worst case scenario, yeah, uh, he got one year of twenty two million, and then can get the same mid level contract that he was going to get uh, last year. By the way, Woj just tweeted out the NBA sent out new salary cap projections for oh. this coming summer. Right, they are the got? same as the last update, which um, I mean, those are the numbers we've been operating under, but they're a little underwhelming. the The jump is only about three and a half percent, whereas the last couple of years it's jumped ten percent. So right, um, yeah, interesting. All right. Well, maybe the, I don't know. I guess they're they're still negotiating for the new TV day deal and everything like that. So yeah, I believe this one runs out at the end of next season. Yeah, well, we'll see. Um, can I ask you? Let me let me throw you the, the the we we rarely do this on this show, but it is sports radio. Can I give you the, the the flaming sports radio topic that is like not entirely serious, but a little bit disingenuous, but still pretty fun? Sure. 
So Shams also reported that uh, Bronny James ah. is declared for the 2024 NBA draft. Um, he is also entering the transfer portal as well. So basically, and, and he's eligible to come back to college, depending on if he doesn't like necessarily how yeah. the draft process works. So all his options are the table, except for the fact that he's not going back to USC. Okay. Yeah. Um, but anyway, he is he is entering the, the 2024 NBA draft. The Raptors do potentially have three picks in this draft. Blake Murphy, do you want to see the Raptors draft Brownie? which could potentially lead a team like the Raptors with a lot of cap room to also sign LeBron. Yeah, I mean, that's not going to happen. Um, Why like, not? <laughs> because... We have, with, didn't we do a whole segment on this show where we're like, we yeah. got all this money, yeah. right? You option... Okay, Bruce Brown, sorry, no player option. Uh, Gary Trent, sorry, you're not re getting re-signed. You know, we, we'll wait to re-sign quickly. All of a sudden, you have a lot of cap room. You do have picks. You could take Bronny and sign LeBron. I'm just saying. I Yes, I, I understand that that layout and that theory. I think the likelier scenario would be you take Bronny at, say, 31, uh -huh. and then LeBron makes the Lakers call you and, like, give you an, a too much value for Bronny trade. Because LeBron would be like, I don't want to leave the Lakers, but yeah, I want to play, like, with, yeah, I wanna play know, with Bronny. That guy, Anthony Davis, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can I have him? <laughs> but, like, imagine, like... You, How much you want your son, LeBron? <laughs> like, you take him as a second-round pick, uh -huh. and, like, your plan is to leverage the Lakers into yeah. giving you, like, a future first or something like that for a second, for a guy you just took yeah. in the second. <laughs> we're using picks to take I know. kids on so like, this, What are we doing? This is the other thing, is, like, if the Raptors were... Brody James, not Sue Young, man. If the Raptors were in a better <laughs> competitive situation, um, maybe you could get creative uh, with that, but like yeah the 31st pick you gotta you gotta use that pick properly yeah, yeah. um the lakers I do agree. have the 55th pick though that's where it gets really interesting wow. is like because like right now you really want to be drafted to your dad's team with the 55th pick it just doesn't doesn't quite hit the same as ken griffey senior no junior, it doesn't you know? but also like you get to play with your dad for a year oh that's I'm, I'm sure that's what every 19 year old wants man. yeah they're just like yeah i can't i'm looking forward to more time with my dad at 19 yeah um yeah, but it's time with your dad at 19 on a two-way deal making 400K or going back to school and, like, being a... Like, I don't yeah. know. Like, look, a Bronny season got derailed because of the health issues that he dealt with. Mm -hmm. But, like, this is a prospect This is a prospect who, when he was, like, 14, 15 years old, was considered close to the number one in his class. Yeah, sure. And now yeah. is, like... I mean, I haven't read the, like, Vicini's and Javoni's and Jeremy Wu's take on this yet. Yeah. But, like, every, from everything I understand, he is not an NBA prospect right now. Okay. Um, so this would be, like, and, and look, this doesn't necessarily mean he's entering the NBA draft. Um, you have until May 31st to withdraw. That means you can go through um, workouts with teams. Yeah. You can go to the Combine. You can do the G League Elite Camp it's and the Chicago. Experience. Really yeah, nice. and, and a lot more guys do it now that you're allowed to. Because the, the withdrawal date used to be much earlier. And you wouldn't be able to get this feedback from teams and stuff like that. Um, so that's that's helpful. I also wonder if this is keeping open the decision for him of like, yeah, do I want to do college and continue down the path of trying to be like a legitimate, get back to being a legitimate NBA prospect? Or like I could make the jump, probably get a two-way with the Lakers and like continue my development in the G League in a, in a pro yeah. environment, which like there is a developmental argument for that. It's just as I understand it from the people who have watched Bronny and covered Bronny, like he's not at that level of prospect. Like like mm -hmm. purely developmentally, he should probably go back to college. Yeah. I, this is, I mean, look, uh, thank you for entertaining this little <laughs> shock yeah. jock radio Yeah, segment. I probably, no, look, I was nowhere. probably too serious about it, but no. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the Raptors are not in a good enough place talent-wise yeah. to get funny with their draft picks. I, I just think, like, this is where I think LeBron actually, ironically, even though he named them after himself, right, he's, he is LeBron James Jr., although he is Bronny, but, like, um, I think LeBron had said it, too. He didn't want to put the expectation um, on him this degree and i think that's the part that's like really unfair it's like it's hard to talk about just Bronny as a player as a prospect and not ever bring up lebron you know and i mean i don't think it's, the conversation is complete without doing it but it does kind of like just rob him of his own agency <laughs> you know what i mean like nobody's even talking about picking him because of his merits as a player they're all talking about it like well how could we get lebron in this like you know bogo deal basically like yeah yeah i don't know and that, and that sucks man that it totally does sucks yeah. It does. And it would really, I think it would really suck if, and again, there's the health part of this that obviously complicated his, his path as a prospect this year. I think it would really suck if you were like a borderline first round pick kind of prospect or like early second round pick kind of prospect. I think it sucks a little less if you're like an undrafted kind of sure. prospect where it's like, yeah. okay, this is, this is your path. Like, th like the thanasis element. Right. Like, I don't know. You just kind of have to accept where you are if that's your your only path in, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, I, 
That one's different because you yeah. can like it's one thing. It's like all right, you're holding it down for your brothers, which is exactly what Giannis has done. And yeah. that's actually honestly, if you get into the whole family dynamic, like that's what Thanasis has done for all his younger brothers. Yeah. And so Giannis is trying to pay him back, and I'll say Thanasis is like good enough at least to like you know like yeah be in the I'm, league. I'm like, not criticizing. It's, it. it's like a he's a highlight reel when he goes yeah. in because he he'll make a big mistake or here too, but like. He's, he's okay-ish, but, like, that's totally different than, like, father and son, man. Yeah, and, and we, we don't have a father and son example, right? We like, really it's, don't. it's uh, yeah, the the Griffey one that you mentioned, like, yeah, it happened for a minute. It was really, really cool, but, yeah. like, this this doesn't really happen. So there's nothing to compare it to, and I don't know. I, Is I get, it compelling to you, like, if, if LeBron and his son play together in the league for a yeah, couple years? Yeah, it's fun. Like, okay, it, it would be, like, it's a, I don't know, it's a cool, like, footnote uh, toward the end of LeBron's career. It, it would it's be, something yeah. we've never seen before. And I think more than anything, it, like, it really does hammer home LeBron's longevity. Yeah, we, yeah, you know what? You're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, all right. It's time now for Between Lines, mm -hmm. brought to you by Bet Rivers. Take a chance. The Raptors are 15-point underdogs tonight at Milwaukee, over under set of 227 and a half. Uh, they will have RJ and Kelly Olynyk back, who sat out last game uh, because of the back-to-back. Yeah, Gary Trent Jr. with the back issue is questionable. Okay. Bruce Brown with the knee issue is questionable. Okay. Ochai Abaji with the hip issue is questionable. That's actually really well. promising. Yeah, yeah. Uh, especially if you look ahead to Sunday. Like the fact that those three yeah. guys are are up in the air for tonight. Right. Um, Barnes, Portal, Boucher, Carton, Porter all yeah. still out. Um, but yeah, Trent Brown and Abaji could potentially play on the Bucks side. And they've gone a little bit Lakers with this lately, where Giannis and Dame are questionable a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. But Giannis and Dame are both questionable for this game. Uh, Pat Bev is as well. And then Marshawn Beauchamp. We got to get humbled by Pat Bev again. Yeah. Oh, please. Uh, Marshawn Beauchamp, yeah. doubtful if you uh, if you care about that. So the Bucks did right. just lose to the Wiz and Grizzlies on a back to back, and they've lost four or five. Uh, and that's with Giannis and Dame like playing a bunch of these games. Mm -hmm. They now only have a game and a half lead on Cleveland for the two seed. I don't know how much they care about that. But, uh, yeah, losing four or five right before the playoffs, probably not the best. Uh, the Bucks probably want this one. Yeah, I would say, okay, cautiously, I would say if you got to wait, obviously, to see who's available, especially when it's like Giannis and Dame. I would definitely wait to see if Giannis is available. Giannis is available, I don't think the Raptors have a chance. Like, it just to, to cover, not not to win the game, just, just to be clear. Because it's like the Raptors have not handled size well at all. The Bucks are already pretty big. But, like, Giannis is, he's, I, I didn't have to explain. Like, he's obviously going to dominate. Dame, I'm like, uh, maybe, maybe. I mean, like, the the Bucks have played pretty well with just Dame and without Giannis recently, which is kind of interesting. But in any case, like, I, I would maybe like the Raptors' chances to cover a little bit more at that point. But, yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, it's, it'll be interesting. I, I, I want to see um, if RJ can continue to have success in the paint. Um, you know, obviously Brooks down there and he's a guy who can really block shots and protect the rim, but we've seen RJ also touch the paint all the time. And, and that's the thing that's been really important. Him and Kelly together, you know, does bring a lot more stability to the starting five. Let's be honest. Like the Raptors, whatever they put out in Minnesota just wasn't the Raptors. Let's be honest. Right. So, um, yeah, and hopefully they see Gary back in just for some shooting and some scoring as well. Like, uh, look, we're closer to having, like, if these guys actually do play, we're actually closer to having, like, an actual rotation. Yeah, like, think about it. If, if so, say all three of those guys could go. Yeah. That was obviously a very bad team against Minnesota. But you're dropping in what it won't be because of Grady and Quickly, but, like, could be your starting five. RJ, Trent, Brown, Abaji, Kelly. Yeah. You're getting five guys back who are in the top eight in your rotation. It's It's entirely a different team. For sure, for sure. You know what? Plus, throw on the Doc Rivers factor. I yeah. think I'm going to pick the Raptors to cover. Wow. wow. I haven't said that in months. Cover that 15-point spread. That was Between the Lines brought to you by Bet Rivers. Take a chance. Well, let's take it a chance. Plus, plus 15. Yeah. Let's, uh, I'm looking forward to watching this. Go. Although, I'm not going to lie to you. It will have to be a two-screen experience tonight. Yeah. At the, at the, at the Lou household. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We got NC State, South Carolina at 7 and UConn, Iowa at 9. Yeah. I'm not trying to miss any part of that. But you will hear the Raptors Reaction Podcast. Perhaps just with me a little bit distracted with another game on in the background. You live reacting to Caitlin Clark <laughs> yeah, deep threes as you're I trying to. It's like, yeah, yeah. So Malik Williams. Oh, my God. Caitlin Clark. Yeah, it'd be fun. Uh, I I'm hoping for more from Malik Williams, too. Just just like not more in terms of like I need him to play well, but just like a more fair chance to like, OK, you've gone walk through with the team. Yeah. You've, you've done a little bit more just like, you know, um, not, 15 minutes not. off the bench instead of 31 as a day one starter against uh, the best defense in the league. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So anyway, that does it for us today. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's New Chuggies by Stoop. 
Time to get fired up. Big thanks to our producer, Ahmed Mon, our board producer, Lance Kennedy, Jennifer Olnick Davis, says Jared Manita for helping behind the scenes. Thanks to our guest today, Michael Grange, and we'll be talking to you next week.